A comedy history lesson. That's what's coming up on the Art of Bombing, episode 179. My friend Dan, he's got a podcast, cause all comics need a podcast. And nobody had a podcast called The Art of Bombing. So Dan went out and bought a tape deck. Who knows why he bought a tape deck? Now cast don't get played on tape decks, but Dan is from the 80s. So hey there, all you funny jerks, come talk to Dan about your work. Tell him all about your worst times. It's the art of bombing. Welcome to a brand new episode of The Art of Bombing. Dan Bublitz Jr. here with you today, the first day of December. That's right, it is December 1st, 2020. And by golly, we did it. We made it to the last month of the year. Woo! And I'm excited for this year to be over, I think everybody is, because it has been a crazy year, and hopefully 2021 will be better than 2020. Uh, it, it can't be worse, can it? I better knock on wood, because we don't want that. Uh, have been off for a couple of weeks. It's been a few weeks since, I, since you, I've reported in with you guys or released an episode, and uh, I'm not sorry because I needed a little break. It was great to uh, take a break after the World Series of Comedy and all the episodes that are released that week and just relax for a few weeks. I'll also... I've been working on some other things. Obviously, you know, uh, if you're a big fan of the podcast, you know that I did a bunch of rebranding. So that required doing uh, some updating on the website, and uh, I got some new merch and all kinds of fun stuff that's available now. You can get stickers, diecast stickers, the, the Art of Bombing comic logo at the, the, the website, artofbombingpod.com slash shop. Check that out. There's merchandise, uh, our shirts, there's apparel, masks, all kinds of things you can get now. Uh, so I've been busy doing that, even though I haven't uh, been releasing episodes. And I've been recording some, too. Uh, like today's episode. I recorded this during the break, and it was a great episode. Today's guest, I said I'm coming back strong, and I am. Today's guest is Lou Deck. He is, uh, he's been doing comedy since the 70s. He's the author of the book Stand Up Decoded, Be As Funny As You Think You Are. He's one of Mitzi's boys. Uh, and if you're a comedy nerd, you know what that means, right? That means he has a long history with the world-famous comedy store in Los Angeles, California. Uh, and we had a great conversation about comedy and uh, a lot about the history of comedy and the history of the comedy store. And he had some amazing stories that he told of uh, a lot of comedians you're going to probably be aware of. Uh, uh, so it was really cool to have him on the podcast. So that's what's coming up. Before we get to that, uh, I already mentioned that we, you know, doing a little rebranding. We got the new logo. Uh, the newsletter went out yesterday. So if uh, you're subscribed to the newsletter, you should have got that in your inbox. Check that out. There's a cool, another cool little epi- uh, essay about uh, comedy and uh, what it takes to be a successful comedian. Uh, pretty fun little thing that I put in there. Uh, and if, you, if you're if you not a subscriber and you'd like to subscribe to the mailing list, you can do that at theartofbombingpod.com as well. Uh, go hit the uh, contact tab, and there is a nice little uh, email sign-up sheet uh, for you, a newsletter sign-up sheet. Actually, it's on all the pages right at the top. Very easy to get to. So uh, check that out. If you want to. Now, we've got uh, coming up December 18th and 19th, I'm doing a virtual comedy show. It is Dan Bublitz Jr.'s Holly Jolly Jamboree Weekend. Uh, Two shows, uh, one show on Friday, one show on Saturday. Comedians from all across the country. It is a virtual show, and it is a pay what you want. That's right. You get a pay what you want for tickets. It's a goodwill donation. All the money that uh, the shows make uh, get split with the comics because, you know, comics, comedians have had a rough go this year with uh, everything being shut down. So all the money that we make is going to get split up with the comics performing. And there's some good heavy hitters uh, and previous guests from the show. I mean, Nick Hoff is going to be on one of the shows. Uh, Alicia Rain, Nathan Holtz, we'll see. Um, you just all kinds of comics, all kinds of them on that list. Uh, two days, so check that out if you will. Tickets for that are available on my website, danbublitz.com. 
Uh, and finally, you know, the holidays are coming up. So, happy holidays? Is it too early to say that? I mean, it's after Thanksgiving. I don't know. I hope you guys had a good Thanksgiving. I did. Uh, I didn't have a traditional dinner. I stayed home because I've been quarantined since uh, I got back from Vegas. I uh, haven't had any symptoms, so I don't think I have the COVID, And I, but I quarantined for 14 days. And I did take a COVID test today, but it'll obviously be a couple days before I get the results. But for Thanksgiving, I just stayed home with the missus, and uh, we had a great day. We watched uh, movies, and, or, and we binged Lilyhammer. That was our, our Thanksgiving. And then instead of having a traditional Thanksgiving dinner, we grilled steaks, and they were amazing. It was an amazing Thanksgiving dinner, we had the steaks, and then we had some traditional Thanksgiving sides to go with it. We just changed up the meat instead of having turkey, and it was fantastic. So, all right, I think that's all I got for this intro. It's good to be back. We're going into the to the holiday month strong, and uh, everything's looking up and up, up and up, up and up. So, all right, here's my conversation with the legendary Lou Deck. Enjoy! And now, it's time for the Stand-Up Soundbite. Hi, folks. My name's Lou. I like to start friendly. I'm from the South. If you would, everybody say, hi, Lou. Hi, Lou. Okay, sounds pretty good. I'm going to ask you to invest some energy in me. Everybody, yo, hi, Lou. Hi, Lou. All right, let's rack this place. People have been in town three days. I have one observation. Folks, there are some fucked up drivers on them streets. <laughs> Driving down bars down today. Stick my arm out the window, signal for a left turn. Somebody takes the damn joint right out of my hand. <laughs> Look behind me, blonde, on a motorcycle wearing leather. <laughs> I went, wow, hey, keep it. <laughs> Officer. <laughs> I'm enjoying being in Louisville. I like the South. I'm from the South. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, my hometown. Any of y'all ever been to Atlanta? Yeah. yeah? like to talk about my hometown. To me, to live in Atlanta, you have to fit one of two groups. You're either a yuppie or a redneck, or some combination of the two. <laughs> either your pickup truck has a cellular telephone, or your Mercedes-Benz has got a rifle rack. <laughs> <laughs> There's a law in Georgia determining what kind of sex you can have. It's against the law in Georgia to have sodomy or oral sex. If they catch you having it, they put you right in prison where you can get all that shit you want. <laughs> I think Bubba and the boys missed the damn point here. <laughs> I like to talk about the South. Came here from Louisiana. They got this thing in Louisiana called Cajuns. Heard about them? <laughs> yeah, Cajuns, I don't trust Cajuns. I don't trust anybody. Might take something dead from the side of the road, put in a pot, call it gumbo. <laughs> Went through Texas. <laughs> Went through Texas, got stopped at the Texas state border. My car didn't pass the inspection. No gun rack. <laughs> got a ticket from a Texas Ranger, and he was pissed. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> yes, sir? Boy, you got any guns in there? <laughs> no, sir. He says, okay, take this in. <laughs> well, I needed it because I was going to Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I went to Arkansas. I want to see what kind of people would elect Clinton governor. <laughs> I couldn't vote for Clinton. I couldn't vote for anybody who doesn't know how to operate a joint. <laughs> if he's a mutual friend but he's a definitely a fan of yours tried to get me to get you on before uh britain Ooh, hackey britain hackey Ooh. yes they... i'm aware of them up in uh sioux city mm-hmm. yes yep he's uh actually about gosh it's been a while maybe two years ago i did a phone-in roast oh nice britain. oh that's and fantastic that, uh, I could only see a still of their set, which was on stage at a certain club. And yep. uh, uh, I have been encouraging them for some time. And I was, uh, I'm very happy to hear that you can, where are you, by the way? So I'm in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota now. So I've, I've kind of wow. moved all over. I lived in San Diego for a while. So I was in Southern California. 
for a little while. And then um, I moved back to South Dakota because that's where I grew up. I lived there for a little while and worked the road out of South Dakota. And now I'm in St. Paul. So cool. Yeah, kind of all well, over. I, I have predicted that this may be where stand up moves. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's it's video I've, online. Yep. And uh, I appreciate the, the chance to practice. Uh, yeah, that's one of them things. Uh, I definitely, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had to step up my, my game a little bit um, with as far as technology goes. Like, my computer was super old and super slow and all this different stuff. So I've definitely upgraded. <laughs> well, I'm using a tablet taped to a music stand. Uh, but this seems to have worked. You like my background? Yes, it looks very good. It's very professional. It's a uh, uh, throw blanket that I have tacked to the wall. It works out well, perfect. Well, I was the original Mr. Video for the Comedy Store, and that uh, technology has moved 10 steps above where I was, but I still know certain things, and I've been encouraging all of my comic friends to maneuver their background. Oh, absolutely. The story goes, when the news uh, uh, bureau started moving to videos at home, they had a, a lady doctor standing in front of her bookcase, and then quite a few hundreds of viewers called in to say, what are those things standing on her bookcase behind her, which were her vibrators set? <laughs> uh, whoops. <laughs> So at that moment, I learned from the pros to maneuver your background. I oh, absolutely. Seen, and I would consider advising you maneuver your background. There's a way you can throw down a video uh, uh, background or you can tape something up behind you. No, absolutely. But, I, I actually, when I perform stand-up, I don't perform from my desk. I actually... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't use it for recording my podcast because, like I said, I don't hardly ever release the the video. If I do, it's just little clips. But when I perform, I put a club down in my basement. So I have a full stage PA and backdrop set up, and that's where I perform when I perform online. Okay. I have to admit I'm unfamiliar. Will this be appearing mostly as a audio podcast? Yes. Yep, mostly oh, audio. Okay. Yep. And there I dressed up for you and everything. No, that's good though, because it's good that you're dressed up. Because when I like I said, I might release some of the some of the video as well. I do have a YouTube channel, so it's you're, always you're good. Welcome, you're welcome to do that in, in its entirety. Um I was on a Zoom show Thursday. How with, how Oh, go ahead. With, how can I say but less than experienced comics? <laughs> would you yes. know would you know the name French Stewart. Um, the actor? Yes. Yes. I'm familiar he with French Stewart. Letter. I oh. asked to go first. They asked me to go third instead. I said, okay. But everybody showed up in T-shirts. And I thought it was a, uh amateur move to show video of yourself. Yeah. Then, then show clothes. So, yep. A, maneuver your background, B, dress up, C, smile. Yep. My one week so far, and I've done, uh, what, seven interviews and four Zoom shows. My one weakness so far is looking at the camera rather than my image or your image. Yeah, like that's I'm something. Looking at, I'm looking at your image now, and if, as you can tell, there, it's a slight eye cast down, whereas if I look at the camera right now, it's dead on. Yep, yep. And in Hollywood, we encourage everybody when you're on camera to look right down the lens because you present yourself better. Yeah. So no, I'm that's still true. learning and practicing too, and I appreciate very much the chance to sharpen my learning curve. <laughs> well, we can all we can all learn and grow. That's for sure. That's something I've learned since I started Especially doing. Especially in the video age of the pandemic. So, yep, I'm absolutely. giving it my best shot. I'm a little uh, I'm I'm a little old school, but uh, I'm happy to be here. I have seen uh, your posts about it, and that I have questioned in my mind. 
<laughs> why wouldn't why wouldn't would want to showcase the art of bombing? Well, because well, you learn from failure. Yes, you do. Good call. <laughs> so yeah. I have a couple of good I have a couple of good bombing stories and uh I'm prepared. I'd appreciate if you'd mentioned the book. I'm known as Lou Deck, the comic in red shoes. Yep. And although I'm naked from the waist down. <laughs> He's got I the red shoes. Red shoes with me. <laughs> That's fantastic. Fantastic. How long uh, do you figure we'll go? How long? Well, it'll go about 45 minutes to an hour. I try to keep them under an hour. I uh, agree. Uh, not typically with, uh, you know, a lot of podcasts, they'll go for hours if they can, and I just. That's not for me. I people have short attention spans. I mean, you well, look at completely. the the technology and like videos and stuff now, like like TikTok and Instagram Reels and these different you know platforms. All these videos are less than a minute, you know. <laughs> so yeah. like keeping somebody's yeah. attention after for more than an hour, I feel like is a big challenge. So I like to keep well, them forty five minutes. I'm standing and ready when you are. All right. Well. We're already recording, and this has been good conversation already. So, uh, but yeah, we're gonna get into this. Like you, you were asking about why I I would want to do something like this as a podcast or showcase that, and it was because I had a really bad bomb that uh, I almost wanted to quit comedy. I had to be, you know, one of those nights where I had to be talked off the ledge from a friend. And I got to, <laughs> I, and you know, and I started talking to other people about it, and I realized. Other comics were having these same experiences as I was, but they just weren't, you know, nobody was talking about it. We're all keeping it under under the rug, if you will. And, uh, you know, yeah. and I've yeah. always been, you know, somebody that's big on self-improvement and, and continuous improvement and always trying to strive to get better. And what better way to learn comedy Absolutely. than look at our failure? <laughs> Absolutely. I have several... Standard pieces of advice is uh, first, record every show. Second, uh, watch them five times before you perform again. And as it turns out, when I started at the comedy store, as a doorman, Mitzi, the, Mitzi Shore, the owner, would put me at the back of the original room in the hallway. Mostly I because I was the biggest, largest comic there for her <laughs> and I could intercede with people sneaking in the back. But what year? I, did, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask what year did you start working at the comedy store? Uh, 76. Wow. Wow. Cause that's something else. I, I should perform let... maybe. I performed oh, maybe 20, 30 times in Texas before I moved out. Mm -hmm. My joke is I quit law school stand up and 47 years later my mother still pissed off about it <laughs> oh that's but great that i had the uh, great fortune to meet the manager and a fellow comic uh at the westwood comedy store the the uh intercollegiate version and he hired me as a doorman uh his name was ollie joe prater who was possibly the greatest act i've ever seen even after seeing thousands at the comedy store. Wow. And uh, he hid me from her for about three months before she wanted to see me and showcase me because that was a requirement. Mm -hmm. But uh, when she moved me to the Sunset Store after maybe a year at the Westwood Store, uh, it was because I was taking a class from fair two fairly experienced comics and at some point, they asked her if they could video the class and talked her into buying equipment. And that's what I was doing in college, radio, TV, and film. So when she bought the equipment without asking them, she didn't know how to operate it. She Nobody knew how to operate it. The two teachers of the class knew my background and said, Lou, come look at it. She First time to meet her, she said, if you can hook it up, show me. So I took it out of the boxes. I hooked it up. It was a Sony outfit, and within three, four minutes, I'm producing video. She made me the video director. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. And what is now the comedy channel for the comedy store was my old basement office, 
And then when she put me on the door, and this is where I was headed with the story was, she put me on the back door. I could see into the original room and follow the show as well as control the traffic in the back hall. And she said, Lou, the quickest way to get better is by eliminating mistakes. So I got to watch the regular lineup six nights a week, 15 comics a night, and see their mistakes. So that helped me to avoid making those kind of mistakes. And I seem to have a quicker learning curve than most. So I was with Mitzi from 76 to 85. I ended up having three different offices as the video director. <laughs> In the later years, I had what is now the non-paid regular bar, the VIP room, as my mm -hmm. video office. She out uh, fitted it with uh, cameras and VHS decks and three-quarter inch v uh, video decks. <laughs> and, people so would, and people would seek me out to hide in my office before they went on. So I got to be friends with Richard Pryor, Robin Williams, Andy Kaufman, Rodney Dangerfield, because they wanted to hide in my office. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I'm laughing because uh, you're talking about VHS decks and stuff like that, and I'm sure there's people that'll be listening to the podcast that are like, what's a VHS deck? <laughs> I, I broke in with Betamax. Yeah, like I'm at that age where I'm old enough to remember a lot of that stuff. You know, I was still a kid when that stuff was out, but I still remember it. But I know there's, you know, comics that are in their 20s that have never heard of VHS or Betamax. <laughs> well, I encourage you to go to my timeline on Facebook and look, scroll down for ways, and you'll see I have some original footage that I shot in the main room of Robin Williams singing a reggae song called oh, wow. Quaalude Vibrations. It was a matter of, have you heard of the great comedy strike? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I read uh, I read the uh, I'm Dying Up Here book. Motor so. Cedar, he's a heck of a guy. He featured me in the book. Letterman yep. called me up and says, why does he think you were a pro? You were a rookie <laughs> then. So he and I become very close friends, and that uh, um, all I can say is it really brought me to the fore in comedy. Maybe two and a half, three years ago, they made a movie of Sam Kennison. Mm -hmm. Do you know the name? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. So in the movie, I tell a story. Sam and I are getting high over by Mitzi's car in the parking lot late after closing one night, and we hear Mitzi getting beaten up by a, com uh, a comic. They were both high and drunk and snorting coke. And so we run over and rescue her. And as we get right to her, I went around the last car. Sam pulled the Hollywood trick of sliding across the hood and kicking the comic in the face. And two weeks later, Sam became manager of Westwood. So it really helped his learning curve because he would cancel the late at night acts and take the time himself within less than eight months he became the beast which you know today mm -hmm. but oh, wow. in the movie they made a cartoon of the scene me oh, and really? sam wearing <laughs> mitzi me wearing the red shoes and it's every little boy's dream to become a superhero and rescue a damsel in distress <laughs> and they put it into the movie Oh, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Once now, again, once again, by the fortune of fate in kind of the comedy goddess, I got brought to the fore. And then just now another one has happened. Uh, Showtime put a series on the history of the comedy store. Yeah, I was Her just going to ask about that. It was, it was produced and directed by one of our comics from the old days who was a very good friend of mine named Mike Binder. He yep. was kid comedy and one of the best teenage acts there's ever been. But after 10 years, he turned 30 and he was no longer a kid <laughs> and he couldn't do the act anymore. At any rate, he's uh, what he's uh, executive producer of Ray Donovan. He writes most of the scripts. He has three spy novel, novel uh, books out that did very well. 
an old, 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 old friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And that when Showtime picked him to direct, he was kind enough to include me with all of the big names. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Once again, right place, right time. Maybe six, seven times in my career, uh, I have been uh, the recipient of incredible luck and fortune by being at the right place in the right time. And uh, what I've always said, I've been to there so many times, I can smell the right place and the right time <laughs> and get that, there in advance. That's a good sixth sense to have. <laughs> and I consider this one of those times. Oh, thanks for having that's... me. Thanks for the privilege of being a guest on The Art of Bombing. Oh, well, I've been, like I said, I wanted to get you for a while. I'm glad this worked out. Now, on that, that documentary that they did, I haven't watched it yet because I don't have showtime. Uh, I'll probably take look for it. Take it for a free month on trial and binge watch it. Oh, that's a good idea. That's probably what I'll that's do. What I've been telling everybody since it came out. Did they use did you some of your footage then that you filmed at the um, comedy store in it? There is there is some discussion of whether or not Robin's heirs mm -hmm. want challenged that. So they oh, used okay. from it. But as a matter of fact, the comedy store library exists because I started it in seventy eight. Wow. That's and amazing. That they've they've grown incredibly. We had seven, eight productions, they probably up to 30 or 40, plus a, another 30 or 40 of self-produced videos, not exactly appropriate for network TV or mm -hmm. Showtime, or, but that uh, they included stills from the Robin uh, footage. And, and uh, when you watch it, watch for seeing him wearing a beret cap with a harmonica. And indeed, I have two clips of that on my timeline because it did not survive in the Comedy Store video library. I have the originals. Oh, that's good. That's in and safe hands. <laughs> and a personal agreement from Robin to use it in promotion of myself, not only my video career, but my comedy career. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm that's incredibly awesome. fortunate to have that. And because it's now become unique. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to uh, check that out. That's that's really cool. Like I said, I was also you. You told me to look at some of the other clips that you did uh, because you were at the the Clean Comedy Challenge doing. Leslie some... Norris Townsend runs that, and she's quite the comic herself, mm -hmm. and has been producing it for three or four years straight. We didn't have it this year because of the pandemic, but we'll do it again next year. Yeah, they changes everything. <laughs> right. And that uh, she had arranged with the Ice House here in Los Angeles, which is uh, over in Pasadena, maybe yep. 30, 40 minutes from the comedy store. Yep, I and, love that. Well, like love I told you, I'm I'm Mr. Video. I brought a cameraman and taped my seminar. So yep, what you're seeing on those clips is what I was advising the 20 contestants for the clean comedy challenge. And I just wanted to see if I was making sense. Then it turned out that they were better than I thought. So we clipped them some and that'll be uh, there forever. I'm not a social media guy. I don't link. I don't gram. I don't twat. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, on I'm, Facebook. <laughs> I'm on Facebook because my publisher asked me to do that to support my book. So there's no cat videos or recipes or me at the beach on my Facebook account. It's just my legacy, my career, my well, and it's unique, a good <laughs> unique uh, 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 situations. Well, and I've had a bunch. I got to be honest with you. I can remember right after I started shooting video, we had a number of comics in the late 70s preparing to go up this golden staircase of stand-up and that she decided that if they worked with me and the video, it would accelerate their growth. So four different comics, I would tape their set. We would go downstairs to the basement uh, studio, watch the tapes, and then go put them on in another room with the notes being absorbed. 
And at, through that, four different comics got the Tonight Show and became major stand-ups. Uh, oh, at, that, at, at that point, uh, word got around and that when group comedy started, you see Mitzi had group comedy in the main room of the comedy store. There are three different performing rooms at the comedy store sunset. There's the original room, seats about 220. Um, there's the main room, which he can seat up to 700, and an upstairs lounge called the belly room, which was started to promote female comics. So somewhere about the first six months, I've got all these tapes of these four guys, including Mike Binder, the uh, 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 producer of the history of the Comedy Store series. And we'd go into my office and talk about, well, you blew this joke. You should have said this. You should have done it this way. And at some point, she's down in the basement with me looking at all the tapes saying, why do you need so many tapes? Because she had to buy them. (laughs) <laughs> and I, to- I, I told her, this is I'm building a library for all time here. But what I discovered is, Mitzi, you have to copyright and start the comedy channel. It took me seven, eight months to talk her into it. I even got her to sign an agreement to do to buy satellite time on Telstar 2, which is not even in the air anymore. <laughs> But that she copyrighted it, and then when Comedy Central came out, they branded themselves the Comedy Channel, and we sued the heck out of them. Mm-hmm. Is HBO, that why they changed their name then? They had to. We were yep. going to make them pay us $10 million. A year after they changed the name, HBO offered... $3 million just for the name. Not our tapes, not the comedy store, just the name. And she turned it down, and the quote was, and if you talk to people who know Mitzi, they do impressions. <laughs> yeah. Mitzi says, nah, I don't want the comedy store to become a video brothel. So, no, she turned the offer down. At the time, we were doing a business as comedy store productions, but then it became the Comedy Channel presents Comedy Store Productions. Mm-hmm. So I went through the Comedy Store system. I was with her from 76 to 85. As with all comics, once you get to a certain point, you want to go work around. And I started getting job offers in California as a host, because that's what Mitz- Mitzi thought she I did best. And guys that would produce their own shows that are around today, uh, Bob Zaney, uh, Jeffrey Wayne um, would hire me 100 bucks a night, which when you're working for 20 bucks a night as a doorman is a lot of money. Yeah. And I would travel to cities around uh, California and host the shows for them. Well, all I ever wanted in the world was to be Johnny Carson's replacement. Then it turns out there's a line. The talent coordinator for comics at The Tonight Show, Jim McCauley, told me, he said, what you are doing is called spokesman monologist. And, Lou, look who's in front of you. David Letterman, Jay Leno, Gary Shandling, uh, Arsenio Hall, uh, Will Durst. Um, Trying to think. He called me 12 people back in line and said it took an average of three years to advance in line each spot. Wow. So I realized very quickly I wasn't going to get the Tonight Show, nor was I going to make a lot of progress out in Hollywood. So my mentor, Ali Joe Prater, guy who hired me to begin with, had become a fabulous act on tour, asked me to go on tour with him because he needed a good host. That year, we worked 87 cities, 1985. In 86, 87, and 88, we worked 100-plus cities. He loved one-nighters because they paid more, Mm -hmm. and I was driving the car. (laughs) Pretty convenient for him. (laughs) So as a large man, uh, 400 pounds, 5'6", 
as a large man, he outgrew the, the car pretty quickly when we, we toured in an RV, but getting to go to so many places and so many different kinds of venues that we wrap, I, I had to grow or lose the job. Mm-hmm. And that uh, after a while, we eliminated the opening act. I became the feature MC, and we started doing two-man shows. Yeah. And every time I got a great hunk that was dirty or drug-oriented or uh, profane, Ollie would buy the set from me, and I had to write more. Oh, man, that's that's good and bad. I mean, it's good oh, that no, you're... no, no, no. Let me tell you, it was magnificent. Mostly, <laughs> it, kept, it kept me as a clean act. Because we're doing a two-man show, we need to present a broader spectrum, and I don't want to steal the upward from him every night because he uses it constantly. So it did nothing but good things for me. It forced me to stay clean. It forced me to write a lot of material. And then it it taught me how to perform in any venue. We've done prisons. We've done football stadiums. We've done auditoriums. We've done comedy clubs. We've done everything like that you could imagine. So when I got back to California, I was three times more experienced than anybody in Los Angeles doing 15 minute sets. Yep. And I came back in, uh, came back for four months in 85 and somebody saw me in Palm Springs at a gay club because I have gay material, but they like it and asked me to do USO tour, entertaining the troops overseas. Yep. Well, long story short, My grandfather died in World War II, fighting the Japanese in the Pacific in the Philippines. He survived the fall of uh, the Manila, the fall of the the Philippines. There's a famous uh, horrible event called the Bataan Death March. The Philippines, um, when the Americans surrendered to the Japanese, 22,000 Americans surrendered. They marked them 75 miles through the jungle. And if you couldn't keep up, they bayoneted you. If you mouthed off, they shot you. If you ran over to try to get some water, they cut your head off. So it's called the death march because 10,000 Americans died during it. Oh, wow. I guess I'm not familiar with that. At the end of it, they put the survivors in three different prison of war camps. Maybe five years ago, there was a movie called The Great Raid about American soldiers going behind the lines and freeing the prisoners in one of the prisoner of war camps. At any rate, that was the one next to where my grandfather was. My mother got two letters from the prisoner of war camp and never heard from him again. Two years after the war, she got a telegram from the Department of Defense saying, your father died missing in action. We don't know anything. Forty-four years later, I'm telling jokes in the Philippines to American troops. Our, wow. we, were there for, there, there, we were there for a month in the Philippines, and because there's so many bases and so many different places to do shows for isolated uh, military. The last show was at the Presidential Palace in Manila called Malacang Palace for Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos. Remember that name? I don't I don't think so. The wife of the president was starving people so she could have a 2,000 set of shoes closet. Oh, Jesus. Wow. At any rate, we do the show. He comes over to me in the diplomatic line later and says, hey, you were very funny. I liked your cat jokes. (laughs) Can I do anything for you? Out of the pocket comes a picture of Grandpa. His name, Colonel Van Frederick Houston, United States Army. He blanches at me for a second, calls a general over. The general called a captain over. The captain called a lieutenant over. And he and I, the lieutenant and I started working. Within a week, I found my grandfather's grave. Wow, that's amazing. The greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life, much less in comedy. And all because 
I was on the other side of the world telling jokes. Mm -hmm. Wow. I got back to America in time before my grandmother, his wife, died and was able to show her the monument to his unit and his name as the commander. I got to my mother, his daughter, and was able to show her what happened to her daddy in World War II. Because I was on the other side of the world telling jokes. That's Thank amazing. you, Mitzi. Thank you, <laughs> wow. Common Soul. Uh, and that's just one. I've had 10 miracles. That's that's, that's one of them. That's the best that's one. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. That's, oh, man. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's hard to, there's hardly any words for how beautiful that is. And it's amazing. Because it is. You're right. It's amazing. Like, being because of comedy and telling jokes, something that sounds so like to a lot of people, it sounds easy to do and it. People don't take it serious. And they're like, Oh, you're a comedian. What do you really do? That kind of stuff. Uh, and to be able to, to, you know, to do this and then for that to happen, that's just amazing. I love it. And now here, it. here's the punchline, Dan, his name, Van Frederick Houston. He was the, Great, great, great grandson of Sam Houston from Texas. Really? Which is where I was born, which was both my parents were born in Texas. I, I ended up growing up in Houston because dad moved us there when he was working for the Air Force for the Lockheed Aircraft. But I'm a Texan. I cleared the last male Houston's name. Wow. Because I was telling jokes on the other side of the world. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now that don't mean that don't mean that don't mean Jack in Hollywood, but in Texas it's big time. <laughs> so, well sometimes it's the little accolades that matter the most, you know. <laughs> well the, what happened was my dad, some Pollock, made off with the heir to the Houston name, my mother. Mm -hmm. And got rejected by them because our name is different. And yet, the black sheep solves the mystery. <laughs> On top of that, uh, my mother got a brown star, a silver star, a purple, a purple heart, and sixty-two thousand dollars insurance money. Oh wow! Wow! It was eight thousand dollars during the war. What they call service group life insurance that all military members had, but it sat there for forty years. Mm -hmm. So it accumulated some interest. Yes. Well, and at, at that point, the things just keep happening. I turned out to be the first ever to work 100 cities a year in five straight years in stand up. There was used to be a real fine company in out of Charlotte, North Carolina, called the Comedy Zone. Mm -hmm. And they were a one nighter bunch. There's one there's point, there are several say, clubs still named the Comedy Zone, but the yeah, zone okay. when they started was a series of one nighters. Okay. So they it. had they had eighty two cities. Wow. Now, now I work for another group, and you might have heard of them, Tom Sobel and the Comedy Caravan out of Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. Who I'm, had forty one cities. Now in the old days, all all you needed was, if you wanted to work all year, you needed 26 clubs. You could work twice a year. But just of those two organizations, by the time I finished working all the comedy zones and all the comedy caravans, it was time to go back. And they loved me. So I had more work than any comic that's ever had in America before. Wow. And that, that's how I got 100 cities a year. And toward the end of Ollie's life, we just went to the places that he liked. And when he died, I came back and worked both systems for five straight years. So I worked 100 cities a year in 10 different years. And no one's ever come close to that kind of record. Yeah, that's we amazing. Discovered we discovered then lots of people get hired once. Not many people get hired a lot. We have in stand-up a couple of phrases. One is called the rehire rate. 
-hmm. How often do they rehire you? And since I'm a comedy store comic, I can go on in any of the three spots of a standard comedy club and make sure the the show works correctly. Even if I don't know the other acts, I know how to fix them from each spot. And they used to call me comedy insurance. <laughs> put Ludek on the show, he can make sure the show comes off great, whether he's the opener, middle, or headliner. That's uh, good. And that's a good skill to have. A lot of comics don't realize, you know, especially nowadays, it seems like when, you know, even like showcase shows or whatever, you get these comics that come on and they're trying to be the best comic on the show and try to stand out the most, which is good, but it's also not that great because it's a show. You want the whole show to be good. It's not, you know. Teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. Exactly. Teamwork. Every position in the show is important uh, well, to, to create a good one, show. That's right. And here's one you may not know. Mitzi opened for the Comedy Store uh, a three-act club, the first three-act club in La Jolla of San Diego. Yep, I performed at the club. The Comedy Store in La Jolla. Yep, I performed there. We went there. through the first year trying to figure out what the formula should be and what is in use in 90% of the places today is a three-act show. Mm -hmm. The opener does 15, the feature does 30, the headliner does 45 with a five-minute uh, encore. Now, we know that the crowd gets tired after that amount of time. Only mm -hmm. uh, an oversized ego should push them further because you get diminished response at the uh, during the headliner at about the 55 minute mark. They simply are tired of laughing. Yep. So it doesn't sound as good. And yet now today, if you look at the formula, these guys want to stay on an hour and a half and they're hurting the club and they're hurting the other acts and they're hurting themselves and you can't convince them. You know, amateurs. Yep. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. It's, I mean, it really takes, I've seen some comics do that where, and very few have done it to the point where the crowd was still engaged and still energized after that, you know, 55 minute mark. I mean, well, I've seen one, a couple, but very few. Yeah, Here's one you may not have noticed. <sighs> During the headliner set, checks come out. Yep. Which check says drop. the waitresses bring out the checks, hoping to get the majority of the crowd to pay their checks before the show ends so there's not a big clog. So some 40 minutes, 42 minutes, as Mitzi figures it, there's a lull in the show. If you're headlining and you see checks come out, don't waste your material. It won't look good. Take a break. Kill some time. Have a drink. Say something about tipping your waitresses. But don't go counter the force by trying to force laughter from a crowd that's only 30% paying attention. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's I'm going to tell you, and some people consider me arrogant for saying this, there's no place in the world like the comedy store for the lesson that teaches comics. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have, uh, there's a group we call Mitzi's Boys. Once she selected you and you work for the club, you got more spots. You got coaching. You got video. At one point, Mitzi had bought a house on the next level of the Hollywood Hills above the comedy store, and she started housing her favorites there. Now, to give you some progression, the comedy store is located at 8433 Sunset Boulevard. There's a very nice first-class hotel right next door called the Hyatt. Now it has yep. been bought and the change name, the name has changed, but during my days it was the Hyatt. Directly across the street from the Hyatt was an apartment building. Eight or ten comics lived there, and that at some point Dave Letterman was getting discouraged about Hollywood and he was threatening to leave. And Mitzi rented him an apartment right across the street, maybe 70 yards from the comedy store. 
Well, as Dave hit, now Dave's the generation before me. I know him and I mess with him, but I'm not, he's in the, the grade ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Well, so when he hit and got the Tonight Show, she got him a development deal. I think it was with CBS for $100,000. Now he doesn't have to live in a one-room apartment. And he went and rented a house in the Hollywood Hills. Well, her next in line, a gentleman named Argus Hamilton, the greatest joke writer I've ever met, a political humorist like Will Durst, got the apartment. Uh, when she got the house, he moved into the house above the comedy store, and they looked around, and Mincy said, do you want the apartment, Lou? So I got the apartment next, Letterman Hamilton Deck. <laughs> and, That's awesome. And I thought at the time, I've been knighted, and I will be the next Johnny Carson. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I was a valuable operations person not so much <laughs> an act oh, but when the, when the lease ran out Mitzi invited me to live in the comedy house it's on a road called Crest Hill you can check BuzzFeed there's a wonderful art, eight or nine yeah. page article about uh, Crest Hill there but when I moved in Yakov Smirnov do you know the name yep yep the Russian comedian what a country He's the only person in the world, the only comic ever that has a picture of him, Reagan, and Gorbachev. That's pretty amazing. And, and, he's, and he's a fine comic. Uh, he also uh, bought and ran his own show club in Branson, Missouri for a number of years. Yep. Uh, let's see, who else was there? Mike Binder lived in the house, the producer of the uh, uh, history of the comedy store, but at the time was Kid Comedy. Argus Hamilton, my mentor, um, uh, and myself, that's four of us. There was a guy that lived in the maid's room off the kitchen. His name was Andy Silverstein, and he was a costumed impressionist. Hmm, he did full makeup. He did full makeup and costumes doing Travolta and Elvis and, um, Jerry Lewis and, you know, an impressionist. Well, he dropped that. After a few years, he actually became friends with Sam Kennison when Kennison became manager of the Westwood Comedy Store and started canceling acts, which would have got him fired if Mitzi knew. <laughs> so, so Sam was going on late at night, and this Andy Silverstein showed up, and he wanted to try out a different act. And Andrew Dice Clay was born. Oh, wow. And I've known him since he started. That's amazing. Yeah, I've heard lots of stories about that house. Because I listen to Mark Maron's podcast. And, okay. You know, so I've heard a lot about I've that met house. Maron, and... but I've never had a chance to rag him. Yeah, um, he... <laughs> I'm old school. And that I don't care how famous you are, if you're one of Mitzi's boys, you've got nothing on me. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And well, That's I mean, tough. it's just an era, right? My era is long past. Yep. And that uh, to be recognized at all is comedy heaven. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, the the comedy store definitely has a history and it wouldn't have a history without the, the comics that were around in all those years, you know. Um, I mean, obviously, that's why, you know, there's documentaries being made. There's series, you know, TV series and books written about it and everything like that. Well, uh, we, we have a couple of other clubs here in town that have not done too poorly. Uh, I was mentioning that Mitzi brought group, group comedy in before the big comedy strike. And we call it group comedy at the comedy store because we don't use the I word. Mm hmm. You know the I word? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Improv. One of the other club. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so they haven't done too poorly. No, indeed, no. In my amateur days, I worked over there, too. Yeah. But I've... What? Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, I've, I've, I've only performed once at the comedy store. Uh, it wasn't, it was like for a podcast. And I did the Ice House a couple of times. And Great I never... Oh, I love the Ice House. So good. Um, they have a smaller and, room now, too. 
Yep, yep. They they had that the last time I was there. Uh, little side room, which yeah. Well, um, fortunately, I was lucky enough. I got to perform in the main room at the the ice house, so that's great. Best, that was great. Best PA in all of comedy. Yeah, it's one of the best. I was like the room setup. I mean, it, it's it's so good. Like if you know, a lot of comics talk about it, and it's it's so true. If you don't do good in that that room, you're something's wrong because the audience and the way that's set up, it's just a great great room for comedy but the improv is a uh, one that I, I don't think i ever performed at i went and hung out there a couple times when i was in california which it was really cool to check that out and then but um yeah but well like it, i said <laughs> mincy used to say that watching a comedy show watching 10 of them was like doing one mm-hmm. and that i'll be honest with you i'm the least talented comic you'll ever meet however i'm skilled and I'm a good public speaker, and I know where the laugh is. Mm-hmm. So there are well, two kinds of comics, attitude acts and joke acts. My example are Jay Leno tells jokes, Dave Letterman is an attitude act. Mm-hmm. So I'm a joke teller. Um, once you're telling jokes, it's a matter of how to say it. Have you ever heard the phrase LPM? Yeah, yeah, laughs per minute. Laughs per minute. Uh, I clock in as high as anybody I've ever known besides Rodney Dangerfield. I'm not necessarily a one-nighter comic, but the comments I have to say are all jokes. Mm -hmm. So I'll have five jokes getting to the joke. And that uh, I have a couple of videos out I'd like to mention. Uh, (laughs) Let's mention the book. Yeah. Well, I've written a book about stand up comedy called Stand Up Decoded Be As Funny As You Think You Are. Now, in addition to the things I've already said, the quickest, easiest way to get better as a stand up is to eliminate your mistakes. The quickest way to learn what mistakes to eliminate is by watching other comics make mistakes and then not repeating them. Mm hmm. After that, it's technique. Uh, The finest comic I've ever seen of my era is Jerry Seinfeld. Seinfeld is not brilliant in what he says. He's brilliant in how he says it. Mm -hmm. So he can take an inane thought and make you laugh by how he presents it. So I advise new comics First, eliminate mistakes. Second, don't say anything on stage that is not headed for a joke. I don't want to hear, uh, what should I talk about next, or geez, or where are you from? Uh, I want to hear your setup, your punchline, your, your setup, your premise, and your punchline. So that's what my book's about. Now, when I put the book out three years ago, I put out an ebook, uh, meaning, it's electronic print. Now, geez, I'm old. I have <laughs> quite old. Uh, I didn't even know what an ebook was, but I wrote the book, and then I realized when I was a beginning comic, I didn't have the money to spend twenty bucks on a book. So I priced my ebook at three dollars and ninety nine cents. And because I did it like that, I was my my publisher was unable to cover my last request, which was include a video of my set. So I the last chapter of the book, and this is for you too, uh, the last chapter of the book is a word-by-word transcript of a set on YouTube. Oh, wow. That's cool. And it is called Stand Up Be Coded 100 Laughs. It's a short feature set of about 26 minutes. And I get a hundred laughs. Wow. So the, so the LPMs are just over four. Four laughs a minute for a mm-hmm. hundred laughs. Wow. Now with that. Uh, let me finish. Let me finish. Oh, okay. Sorry. So a year later, I meet somebody here in Hollywood. Um, I was Mr. Video back in the 70s and 80s. He's now Mr. Video in the 2020s. 
<laughs> and he and I sat down and recorded a second version of that show called Why I Did It This Way. And it has all of the commentary from the transcript of the act. The act, I just put the jokes in there, but in parentheses, I say, here's why I, I did this joke in this order. But in the new one, why I did it this way, it's an audio. I stop the tape. You hear me say why I make my commentary, and the tape starts again. And that's never been done before. Mm -hmm. So mostly I'm from the era that I didn't really care whether I did TV or not because I didn't want to have to use up my act. Mm -hmm. Once people see you on TV, it's hard to keep doing the same yep. performance. Yep. So I never cared about doing TV. I've done some stuff, but it, it, only because they came up and said, hey, Lou, uh, yep. I do not chase show business. Show business chases me. But once again, 100 cities in uh, in a year, 10 different years. One, invented the Comedy Zone. Two, I mean the Comedy Channel. Two, three, found my grandfather. Four, um, the first ever to give their act with a, a verbatim transcript in a show on YouTube. Stand Up Decoded 100 Laughs. Five, why I did it this way. I keep trying to do things that nobody else has ever thought to do. Now that's a All good. I ever wanted to do was be a good stand-up comic. I could care less if I'm rich or famous. I wanted to be funny. And God blessed me, and I have been. Well, that's good. Now, that's what awesome. Were you ask? I was just going to ask. Uh, all, you got all this stuff out there, and obviously, I'll probably I'll have this in the show notes. But where can people find this? You know, find your book. Do you you have Do you have a website or Amazon, or where is this book available for purchase? I used to do a website, and that the uh, people I was uh, uh, hired in Vegas went out of business, so I went to YouTube. You can search my name. Mm -hmm. And I have seven or eight different shows. As it turns out, uh, the booking agency I mentioned before in Louisville, Kentucky, the Comedy Caravan, has just started a Golden Age Hall of Fame. And that they put five of my sets in there. Different shows over the years. And I'm, I'm not a headliner in any of them. I'm the feature act. But I'm famous for being on time so if you give me the the average spot is 30 minutes to be a feature i will be off at 29 30 leaving 30 seconds for the uh, mc to come on and get the headlighter on mm -hmm. but i work quickly too so the comedy caravan has just put five of my sets i just found out last week um they put another set in and it turns out that I helped them set up their video system and their audio visual guy, their stage manager, is a very close friend of mine. And I used to say he's the younger me. <laughs> and now I have found a gentleman here in Los Angeles. His name is Al Bamani. And he's the even younger me <laughs> and, understands, and understands digital. So that's seven. Then there's a gentleman, a comic named Paul Hash in Texas. About three years ago, he started his own Hall of Fame. Uh, pretty much just pictures online. Mm -hmm. And included me. Number seven, number eight. <laughs> so you see how the miracles keep piling up after each other. I don't need people to tell me I'm funny. I know I'm funny, but now I want to help other comics discover their path to be funny. So I, I first I turned them down, but the second year I said I'd go give a seminar to the Clean Comedy Challenge. Everybody else just walked in there and talked. I brought in video, and now it lives on as clips on my Facebook. Mm-hmm. Page nine. Got it? <laughs> nine. I keep, right. doing, I, keep. I keep doing things that other people haven't thought to do because all I want is this. Now I've gotten what I wanted. 
I have, I've been using the, uh, the quote lately, uh, I've been trying to retire for three years, but they keep pulling me back in. <laughs> Isn't that how it always works? <laughs> well, me and Michael Corleone. So my goal in life now was to try to add to the database about stand-up comedy and make it easier for people to find their voice and learn to be funny and learn to be successful and perpetuate the art form that gave me so much. It's a stupid goal. Here's the last one. I want to get Mitzi Shore, the owner of the comedy store, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. It's impossible. It'll never be done. But you watch me over the next two years. I'll pull this off before I die. She I gave look forward me to seeing that. She gave me everything. And I believe that she deserves. It costs a good deal of money. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, the Hollywood Chamber of Commerce is more concerned with who you can get to show up at the interment ceremony than the money. Yeah. But it's yeah. thirty five thousand dollars to get it done. Wow, that's a that's a lot of money. And but... I have just said to Leno and Letterman and Arsenio and Robin and Richard and everybody concerned. I'm the video guy from the comedy store. And if you don't come to the ceremony, I will show them tapes of you being so bad. <laughs> That's a good threat. <laughs> I love it. So there it is. Um, I do what I do. I am what I am. Uh, one quick last story. I would like, uh, if if we have time too, I would like you to do at least one quick story about a, a bomb because we didn't even get to okay, it. Okay, okay, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do, two, I'll do two, and then I'll be right back for that. But I want to explain the, the origin of my <clears throat> brand. I had broken out of the comedy store. I was traveling around California doing shows. Somebody actually saw me and asked me to be in a review show in Reno, Nevada. A review show is a series of acts making up a whole show. So there was a lady singer, a male singer, there were dancers, there was a juggler, there was an orchestra, and the boy comic. I was the boy comic. <laughs> and it was a huge stage, Harris in Reno. So... They told me, you know, do 15, and we're serious about that at 15, because at 15 minutes, this microphone will disappear into the floor. Get off stage. <laughs> They're serious at the casinos. Mm -hmm. Every moment the show goes long, they lose money from gamblers. So it was so far off the stage, I mean 30 yards to the wings, both of them. So they instruct me to walk down as soon as the mic uh, disappears, take a bow. The, the, the spotlight will shift to the lady dancers coming on. Go to the center of the stage and take the orchestra pit stairs down, winding through the orchestra pit. Well, the second time I, we were doing five shows a day. And that uh, the second time I went down this, the, the orchestra pit stairs, I fell off. Banged my head pretty good. Oh, but no. I got into the show in about two hours. So I got through the second show, uh, went down the steps again, fell off, cut my lip. There, you see the scar? Had to go to the hospital and be back in two hours. Took some stitches, came back with a Band-Aid on it. But I stopped off at Kmart and bought the most ridiculous red plastic shoes you've ever seen. And now I can see my feet <laughs> as I go to the dark staircase. Three weeks later, I'm back at the comedy store. I just made $4,000, which is an all-time record for a doorman at the time for being in the review show. I'm buying pot for everybody and handing out free joints and buying drinks. Uh, a gift of a hooker or two to my favorite comics. You know, showing off. All the important stuff. <laughs> and one comic does not show in the original room, and they come running out and saying, 
you want the fallout, Lou? I was dressed, I was wearing red shoes, and funny enough, it was Mike Binder that didn't show. Oh, wow. So I run on stage. I'm on stage about, and I was doing 15 minutes for uh, the review show. I run on stage, and I am kicking butt. There's nothing like five shows a day for three straight weeks. And I'm in better timing shape and appearance shape. I'm kicking butt. Best show I've ever had in the original room. And I look over and Binder walks in. It was after the strike. We were getting paid. I realized I better, uh, I would get off and let my friend get his paid spot. So I said, uh, good night real quick. I introduced Mike instead of the MC doing it. And then I rushed from the stage heading back through the original room, down the steps to my old station as a doorman, and then out in the parking lot. And as I got to the top of the steps, I knocked an older gentleman on his ass. <laughs> and as he came tumbling down the stairs, I realized I just body blocked Johnny Carson. Oh, wow. I rushed to pick him up. He said, Lou, I didn't know you did stand-up. He knew I coached stand-up but he thought I was a writer and a director. So he had stood there and watched my entire show. And at that point, he looks down at my red shoes and says, Lou, distinctive footwear, great idea. <laughs> and I have been the comic in red shoes since that day. I've never not worn red shoes on stage, and within a year or two, I quit wearing red anything but red shoes anywhere else. That's why I'm Lou Deck, the comic in red shoes. Now, <laughs> as it turns out, over the years, many bookers have looked for me, couldn't remember my name, knew my reputation, and they they would call the various other agents up, and as soon as they, they say, tall white guy, white hair, red shoes, oh, you want Lou Deck. <laughs> That's so good. I read, I credit my brand have has having having made me in my career almost a quarter million dollars. Wow. Uh, I got I got Carnival Cruise Lines from that. So uh, the art of bombing. Here we go, two quick ones. I get a job, and this is not that long ago here in Los Angeles, uh the Pasadena Civic Aud Auditorium, right by the Ice House, to open for a singing act, uh, a DJ I knew here was called and asked for a recommendation. He gave him my name. They called me, said, can you be here in two hours? I said, yes. The name of the act was, uh, they called him the Black Sinatra. His name was Brian McKnight. Oh, okay. Pretty big star. Yeah. I never heard say, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not a Sinatra fan, and I'm not that big in, in the crooning. But yet, I drove over wearing my red shoes. I brought my girlfriend and a video camera and said, we're going to tape my set from the side of the stage so I can learn what I'm doing and get better. 9,000 seats full. Without considering what I was doing, I was told to go on, make sure I stayed on my whole amount of time and get off on cue. And I walked out and my opening words were hi i'm lou deck i'm from atlanta georgia to a black crowd i told them i was a cracker from the south oh man and could not buy a laugh <laughs> for 15 minutes wow i look over i look over five minutes in, into it i'm flooding sweat and Brian McKnight's manager is standing there and he's laughing. I don't know what they know. Five minutes later, I'm still there. I check my watch. I have five minutes to go. And Brian McKnight is standing there laughing. I finished my set. I got off on time. And Brian comes running out from the, the wings and drags me back to center stage to force me to take a bow that I don't deserve. <laughs> because... They knew his crowd wouldn't like me. Oh, man. Because I'm from so, Georgia. 
It was a black crowd. I didn't see any Caucasian people there. And I said the exact wrong thing to open the set and spoil the set. Uh, wow. They paid me. They paid me and they laughed. They said, no problem. We'd like to use you again if you can stand it. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll, ne I'll never say that again. <laughs> and here's the blessing. My video camera didn't work. <laughs> but you already knew so, what happened. So, so. so there's no evidence. <laughs> okay, second bombing uh, uh I'm I'm doing a USO show. I've I've been to 14 countries entertaining the troops. Um I told you on the first one I found my grandfather's grave, but I uh, I developed some fans in the State Department and in the um, the hierarchy of the Department of Defense overseas shows. So I'm doing a show at the 38th parallel of South Korea and North Korea border. Recently, the president of America and I won't say his name and. The president of North Korea met there and took a picture in the exact spot that I was standing. And I have a picture on my <laughs> Facebook page of me standing there. So that night I'm doing a show for the uh, uh, the base there by rules. The war was never, there was never a treaty oh, sign yeah. ending the war. There was an armistice made, which is just an agreement. And it says there'll be a demilitarized zone. So you can't keep troops there except board, guarding the border. And every year for the last 25 years, more people have died crossing the border illegally from one side to the other and been shot by the guards than anywhere else in the world. So we have a base that's five miles away out of the demilitarized zone. And there are 5,000 troops stationed there. And their motto is in front of them all. It's 63 miles from the DMZ to the capital of South Korea, Seoul. And it is the most heavily landmined, obstructed road in the world. Because when the North Koreans invade South Korea, they're coming. Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing going to stop them. They have 6 million troops by the border. We have 5,000. So those 5,000 people are on guard every minute of every day in front of them all. So I'm doing a show for them. And I noticed this is not the only show I've done that where the crowd was armed, but it was the only one I've done where they're sitting on their helmets with their, their weapons across their knees. And not an easy crowd because uh, <clears throat> I'm 30 yards from any of them and on a very high stage. So I had a little difficulty at the start of the show and somebody yelled something to me. I had been told not to do heckler material, but I invented a reason to tell a heckler story. And when I told the heckler story, I hear click, and I don't know what it is, and then another click, and a couple of laughs. And then click, click, more laughs, click, 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 4,000 clicks. I don't know what the heck's going on. I look into the wings to see my escort officer from the army laughing. And I went, what? And he came on stage with me and he says, well, you're a civilian, right? And I said, yes, sir. He says, that's the sound of the safety coming off an M16. <laughs> they were arming their rifles in response to my Heckler joke. What a way to be heckled. <laughs> well, I didn't get it, but when I got it, the <laughs> the escort officer standing right next to me, and I says, he's wearing a forty five on his on his uh, waist. I said, can I have your gun? He says, no. So as he turned, I flipped his holster and withdrew his forty five. I disarmed an army guy, and I went right by the mic, click. And took my safety off. <laughs> I got a standing ovation, and they loved the rest of my show. Oh wow! 
That's so awesome. what I learned was never give up. I would advise any comic, if you find you're in the process of bombing, A, think fast, okay. change material, change tempo, change attitude, but first change enjoying it. Enjoy the art of bombing. As soon as I have a tough show, as soon as I realize it's futile and I'm going to go down like a missile, I start laughing at myself. Yeah, that's a so me good. seeing my own futility. <laughs> it engages the crowd. They will change their mind. And you can stop the bomb. Yeah, so every December, 7th, every December 7th, if I'm performing, I walk out with the intention of bombing. I'll tell half a joke. I'll tell an old long, long joke. I'll do anything to bomb. And it never works because I'm having so much fun and there's so little pressure. <laughs> Got it? That's yeah, yeah, that's enjoy, great. That's almost it, enjoy exactly. the bomb. Yep. And that will that, turn them. <laughs> I like that. Uh, that that's good advice. The, well, all of it was great advice, but I like the idea of having one day a year where you're just like, you know what? Today's the day I choose to bomb, and I don't go out. <laughs> I'm gonna do it, and <laughs> no pressure. I love it. Oh man! Well, this has been so much fun uh, and such a great history lesson. I thank you so much for taking the time. I wish we had all the time in the world. I do want to do one quick. One more quick question before I let you go, because I'm curious with your career, uh, a lot of things that you look at as blessings and, and it's very positive and very uplifting. I'm just curious, what has been your best or favorite gig that you've done so far? I know it's a well, lot. <laughs> well, no, no. I mean, for obvious reasons, the best gig of my life would be the one at the Malakang Palace where it led to me finding my grandfather. Uh, next best would be, as a matter of fact, like I say, I've been trying to retire for three years, uh, right before the pandemic started may, not the second, the ninth, May 9th comedy store decided to do a yearbook show. Oh, and there's one I didn't mention in 1988, the comedy store did a 15th year reunion and we turned it into a special for universal TV. And I was Mitzi's personal assistant for that. And we made a yearbook of the comedy store. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so that was my first book. And because that was my first book, when they wanted to do a show of the old era comics, they asked me May 9th this year. And I went back and... Oh, it was at 7 o'clock. Comedy store opens at 8.30. So uh, it was a small crowd, very small crowd. <clears throat> so it turns out there were 15 people in the crowd, and I had bought tickets for 10 of them, my friends, oh. and and several student comics. And these people were grinning at me at the comedy store, the new era management. Oh, Oh, you don't have a crowd, Mr. Big Time Red Shoes. You're going to go out there and eat it. And what they didn't know was that I cut my teeth doing small shows in the original room. And they sent me out to do a show, not knowing that these are my friends. And I kicked ass. <laughs> so that's the most recent one. If I have that to name a club... Besides the comedy store, it would be the comedy caravan in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, they loved me. They hired me five times a year and for special events and for everything. And the uh, name there is Tom Sobel. In my book, there's a article called The Last Honest Booking Agent. It's all about Tom Sobel and the comedy caravan. But it was like having a best friend to come work for. And that he would call me up and say, how far are you away? Somebody didn't show. Well, I can be there in about three hours. Well, can you make it in two and a half hours? And it's right on the border of Ohio and Indiana. The very bridge that Muhammad Ali threw his gold medal into the river is what you have to cross to get into town. 
and two or three times I've come racing across Indiana, get on the 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 bridge coming across town and met the police escort they had planned for me to get me <laughs> to the club on time. Uh, I will always love Tom Sobel as a close, dear friend and the comedy caravan for taking care of me so many times. But it, it comes down to determination. Half of comedy is willpower and determination. I will tell you another third of it is likability. The jokes are just what you're saying. Uh, Mitzi taught me to be likable on stage. I want to make friends. I start every show I do. I'm from the South. I like to start my show friendly. If you would, everybody say hi, Lou. And I make the crowd say hi, Lou. Then I ask them to invest some energy in me. Everybody say hi, Lou, Gal. And they do. But what I have done is pulled a showbiz trick. When the crowd responds in unison with energy, they've appointed you the captain of now. Mm -hmm. So I do cold openings better than anybody because I, I've done 7,000 of them at the comedy store <laughs> and across my career. And that what I look for a crowd is to make friends because friends will laugh quicker than strangers. Yeah, that's that's such great advice. Uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful advice. Uh, thank you so much, Lou, for taking the time and doing this podcast and sharing all this insight. Uh, this has been fantastic, and I I'm looking forward to releasing this. Thank you. Two things before I go. I have yep. a closing statement. Semper funny, y'all. The Marine Corps say semper fi. Yep. Meaning always faithful. For me, semper funny. And now I got to go. Thanks for having me. Everybody say bye, Lou. Bye, Lou. God bless you, Dan. It's been an honor and a privilege to be on The Art of Bombing. The Art of Bombing is a Blitzed Entertainment production. Hosted and produced by me, Dan Bublitz Jr. The stand-up spotlight bumper was produced by Joe Nicola Music. The Art of Bombing theme music was written and performed by John Holt. All other music was used under Creative Commons licensing. All stand-up audio clips were used with permission from the comedians. You can help the podcast by subscribing, leaving a five-star rating, and a review. For previous episodes, merch, blogs, and more, please visit theartofbombingpod.com. And remember, stay safe so you can live to love.